Part of American life has always been the retail stores we frequent. It is strange, but many people hold a special place in their heart for these stores. It's normally not the store itself, but the memories that come along with that store. Perfect example is my wife. She loved Sears, not because of the things she bought there or the Sears catalog around Christmas when she was a kid, but because her grandmother worked there since she was a baby. Going to Sears to visit grandma when she was young was a thing she looked forward to. For me, there was a record store in Southern California called Licorice Pizza back in the 1980s. I think it started in the late 60s. I was there at least once a week. Every dime I earned washing dishes at my dad's restaurant went to Licorice Pizza. One time when I walked in there, a song I love had just started. I saw an employee walking out of the back room and in my puberty impaired brain, she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. To this day, almost 40 years later, if I hear the English beat song, Stand Down Margaret, I think of Licorice Pizza and that girl. Never talked to her, never saw her again, but I always remember her because of that store and that song. We all have memories of that nature, and a lot of the time it has to do with a store or a mall. Sadly, with all these malls and stores closing, the memories are all we have. As we get older, they start to fade. One of my favorite writers, M. John Harrison, said, Memory commits you to the nuance, the fog. If you act on memory, you commit yourself on the basis of echoes, unpredictable, faint, fading, even as they were generated. No basis to inch out across your life, and yet all you have. Today we look at five of the most beloved chain retail stores that are now just memories. If you guys like this video, let me know what American stores or restaurants you'd like to see in another video, and we'll see if we can get it done. All right, let's take a look. Number three, Miller's Outpost. In the realm of retail where trends come and go with the changing wind, certain names carve out a lasting niche for themselves, leaving behind an indelible mark on the industry. One such name is Miller's Outpost, a retail store that's woven its tail through the fabric of American fashion, lifestyle, and pop culture. From its humble beginnings to the rise of a cultural icon, the history of Miller's Outpost serves as a captivating narrative of entrepreneurial spirit, adaptation, and pivoting with the evolving consumer landscape. The origins of Miller's Outpost date back to 1948, when two brothers, Dave and Lou Miller, founded Miller's Surplus Store. The Miller brothers ran their surplus store for the better part of two decades, when they decided to pursue separate ventures, and as a result, the business folded in the early 1970s. Lou Miller established his own business called Lou Miller's, which expanded to different locations, including the Mall of Orange, San Bernardino, Riverside, Montclair, and East Los Angeles. Meanwhile, Dave Miller started his own clothing retail store named Miller's Outpost in 1972. The company first opened its doors in Ontario and Pomona, focusing on clothing aimed at young adults. The business quickly gained momentum, and by the 1980s, there were more than 100 stores in the region. Miller's Outpost back in the day is where you went to get your Levi's. 501s, we wore those in the 1980s. That's what everyone wore. Southern California being close to the beach, that's pretty much what you had. A couple pairs of 501s and shorts. That was it. And Miller's Outpost is where you went to get both most of the time. As Miller's Outpost gained popularity, Dave Miller decided to sell his company. The new owners continued the upward growth, and then by the end of the 1980s, the number of stores had expanded over 300. These stores would spread across various states, including California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and a few others. In the 1980s, Miller's Outpost underwent a significant transformation. Recognizing the shifting preference of consumers, the store expanded its offerings to include a broader array of styles, catering to not just the counterculture, but also to people that were more interested in fashion trends. This strategic shift allowed Miller's to attract a wider customer base, cementing its place as a relevant and adaptable player in the retail landscape. Now, that shift, I remember, it angered a lot of people because you used to be able to go there and find any pair of Levi's you wanted. Just, they were there. The whole store was like Levi's. And then all of a sudden, they start adding these new fashion things and they didn't have as many pairs of Levi's. So if you were in odd shape, they had to order them. Things like that. Oddly enough, my wife used to work for Gap. Gap went through the same thing. Thing, I would say in the late 90s, early 2000s, when the founder 
retired and his son took over, he decided they were going fashion forward, and that just angered people to no end. Though it did anger a lot of the hardcore fans of Miller's Outpost, it still held on to its style. The brand became synonymous with the laid-back, cool lifestyle of California. That's what the store's advertisements were all about. They were pushing the California lifestyle for a lot of years. I remember there were two types of commercials for Miller's Outpost. There were these Western dudes like frontiersmen type things making jokes around a campfire. And then there was the surf culture. Now, no story or narrative is complete without its challenges. And Miller's Outpost had its challenges. The 1990s brought with them a rapidly changing retail landscape characterized by the emergence of big box stores and e-commerce. Miller's Outpost found itself facing competitors and shifting consumer behaviors. Yet the brand's ability to adapt and innovate continued. They changed the in-store experience, as they put it. They did different things. And in my experience, Miller's Outpost always had the best-looking girls working there. You know, I was a high school kid. That's one of those things you notice, even into my 20s. I don't know if the company planned that one, but it was obvious that's what was going on. They also jumped on the e-commerce bandwagon and diversified its product offerings. And they remained relevant in the early days of the digital age. One of the things Miller's Outpost did to stay relevant was a shift. Miller's Outpost eventually rebranded as Anchor Blue in the late 1990s. A lot of people thought they were bought out by a company named Anchor Blue, but no, it was just their new name. By this time, they were selling all kinds of things, and at some point, they didn't even have Levi's anymore. They were only selling their own products, and they had this one line of clothing called Steel Wing, which is supposed to be this urban type thing, and then they had their own activewear line. Eventually, those two lines were discontinued. Most of Anchor Blue's stores were located in enclosed shopping centers, and as those started to fade, so did the foot traffic, and Anchor Blue, or Miller's Outposts, saw even more challenges. By this time, the company was owned by an affiliate of Sun Capital Partners, which is a Florida-based investment firm. And even being owned by another company, they still continued to struggle. No amount of money was going to save what was going on in the retail space, especially with a company like Anchor Blue, who really never caught on like Miller's Outpost did. That was the problem. Anchor Blue might have had a longer lifespan if they would have kept the name Miller's Outpost or some variant of that and continue to sell things people wanted, not their own brand. Anchor Blue went through Chapter 11 bankruptcy in June of 2009. During this process, they closed over 50 stores, including all their stores in Florida and Georgia. They also started selling some of their other assets. Most of that went to Levi Incorporated. In 2010, the company opened its online site for customers to make purchases. That didn't last long, the sales sucked, and so they decided they were gonna shut it down. And their last couple months, they had a going out of business sale on their website. They were selling everything, including store fixtures, old signage, anything they could ship from the stores, you could have bought it on the Anchor Blue website. In 2011, Anchor Blue officially closed all its stores due to economic struggles. Number two, Hills. Hills Department Store is a cherished part of American retail history that showed how important it is to have customer service skills. Hills Department Store started in 1957 in Youngstown, Ohio by Herbert H. Goldberg, who had been in the hosiery business prior to opening Hills. What began as a small store grew into a popular chain that left a strong mark on both shopping and people's lives. Hills was not just a place to buy things, it became part of American life in the eastern part of the United States. Herbert H. Goldberg ran the stores, which had grown to seven by 1964. That year, Goldberg sold Hills to Shoe Company of America from Columbus, Ohio, but remained as the president of Hills. By the late 1960s, Hills Department Store had grown to 12 stores in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. During this time, they had built a reputation of service, affordability, and in a lot of areas, the only place you should really do shopping. By the 1980s, Hills had taken a giant leap forward, having 99 stores sprinkled, for the most part, on the eastern United States, but they were in the Midwest and the South. They were in Ohio, Indiana, New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, and Michigan. In 1982, Herbert H. Goldberg decided to retire and turn the company over to his son, Stephen A. Goldberg. 
it didn't take long for him to shake things up. He teamed up with an investment firm and bought the Shoe Company of America. They sold off all the subsidiaries but Hills. I talked to a few subscribers who were probably going there as young kids in the 1980s with their parents or whatever. They said Hills was different from other stores. They said it sold everything. To me, it sounded a lot like Sears. I'd never been to Hills. I grew up on the West Coast. But one thing every single person I talked to, which was four people, they all said when they were young in the 1980s, that's where you went to buy video games for your Nintendo or whatever. Other stores had the same video games, but they never had enough of them and they didn't have a big selection. Hills always had a good selection. But Hills sold everything in one place. It didn't matter if you were young, old, had a lot of money, or had next to no money. Hills wanted everyone to feel welcome. And that's where that customer service came in. Everyone felt welcome when they were going to Hills. This made the community feel united around a store. People from different backgrounds could shop all together and enjoy the experience. And you know, Americans, I'm sure everywhere, loved Hills because they offered good products at a good price. That was that old mentality back from the 1940s and the 1950s. If you offer a good product at a decent price, people will stay loyal to you. Hills showed that to be true. From everything I've read and everyone I talked to, Hills seems to have done a pretty good job, at least the leadership, of keeping the employees to believe in that culture. Hills, like so many other stores, also had their own brands, which they controlled. They were their own product. And... They were decent. They weren't just knockoffs of some other company. That usually, when a company's knocking off another big company, you know, doing their own brand, it's usually subpar. Hills was also big into helping local events and charities, which always makes the community feel like it's not just a faceless corporation. It's kind of like a friend. By the 1980s on the East Coast, the retail market had begun to change. Smiling faces and goodwill couldn't help what was coming next. Change. Online shopping, Walmart, and other discount department stores had moved into a lot of the areas. Hills had long established stores. In 1989, Hills went through another revamp. They changed the way they did things. For the longest time, they had all their clothing on just racks where you could just see the, the sleeve of it and you'd have to sift through it. Well, they finally went with the trend that a lot of companies like Gap, Target, and Walmart had been doing. They replaced all the old fixtures and now had the more modern things for apparel where you could actually see the whole sweatshirt you're about to buy and then just sift through the ones behind it to find your size. This made a big change for a lot of companies, but it didn't save Hills. Since they bought out American Shoe Company, they were straddled with a lot of debt they couldn't get over. And for some reason, they decided to buy this chain of 33 stores called Golden Circle. They were already struggling, and they bought Golden Circle, who was another struggling company. This just increased Hills' debt. In the early 90s, Hills started closing stores. In February of 1991, Hills filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. This forced them to close more stores, and they went from 214 stores to 151. A lot of people feel it was just financial and business missteps that killed Hills Department Store. The buyout put them in debt, like I had said. Golden Circle. While they were trying to recover from all that nonsense... The country was hit with a recession in 1990-1991. This was a devastating blow to an already struggling company. In 1993, they brought in an old executive from Sears to try and revamp the company. That CEO and most senior executives resigned two years later. On November 12, 1998, Ames acquired Hills. At the time, Hills was operating 155 stores covering 12 states and they employed over 20,000 employees. They renamed all the stores Ames, and this made Ames the fourth largest retail store in the nation behind Walmart, Kmart, and Target. A lot of the places where Ames and Hills had stores, they'd close down the Hills, and then you know someone else would take it over. Oddly enough, Target took over a lot of Hills stores, and Big Lots and Planet Fitness assumed other ones. Sadly, Ames couldn't even get past the challenging times the United States was in. They claimed bankruptcy in 2000. The story of Hill's department store is about being strong, changing when needed, and caring about the right things. It started as a small store and became an important part of the community. Even though it's not around anymore, Hill's will be remembered for how it cared about the people and connected with its community.
And number one, Sears. In the vast bazaar of American history, few emporiums have held sway quite like Sears. Picture this, a humble company that began as a mail order catalog, an idea conjured up by Richard Sears back in the horse and buggy days of 1886. Now hold your horses. Because this ain't no average general store tale. This is the epic saga of Sears, Roebuck, and Company, an enterprise that evolved from a simple notion of convenience into a force that shaped the very contours of consumer culture. Back in the day, folks didn't have the convenience of a screen to click on things and have it dropped off at your house. And retail satisfaction. Richard Sears had a grand notion. Why not compile a catalog of wares that could be delivered right to your doorstep? Kind of like what we're doing right now without the computer. This brainwave was like a bolt of lightning on the prairie night, sparking a retail revolution. Most of the United States back in the day, if you didn't live in a city, you lived in a rural area. And if you wanted to buy anything, it could be an all-day trip to a small town with limited options. They usually had one general store, and what they had was what they had. They couldn't call down to the warehouse and have it delivered at the shop three days later. It was usually, at a minimum, a few weeks away. From plows to parasols, the Sears catalog was a Pandora's box of desire. Want a stately sofa for your parlor or a slick new wagon for your homestead? Just flip through those pages and let your fingers do the shopping. This wasn't just a catalog. This was everything. A connection woven from ink and paper reaching out across the nation. As we all know, that's not where the story of Sears ended. It went on. Sears decided it wanted to go public and offer stocks. So they made another company of basically the same name. The current company inherits the history and the old company, celebrating the original 1882 incorporation rather than the 1906 revision as the start of the company, when they had their initial public offering on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. For 75 years, the symbol S stood for Sears on the Dow Jones. The new CEO, who had been around since 1907, oversaw the design and construction of the company's first department store. That store first opened in February of 1925. Now, they did something a little bit strange. Department stores of the time were all downtown. That's what they did. Sears started opening stores in lower middle class and working class neighborhoods, far from the main downtown shopping districts. Imagine a city of brick and mortar wish books come to life. In the wake of World War II, Sears hitched its wagon to the suburb boom, erecting colossal stores that beckoned families with promise of endless variety under one roof. It was more than just a store. It was an experience, a cathedral of consumerism. That's actually something I heard years ago when this guy was talking about the mall culture. I heard it in the 80s. Yeah, he's some kind of historian or something, but he referred to malls as a Cathedral of Consumerism. Makes sense. But what made Sears a titan was its dazzling array of goods. It was a pioneer of payment plans, letting folks dine at a banquet of materialism, with their wallets always playing catch-up with layaway. This just wasn't about buying things. It was about buying a lifestyle, a slice of the American dream, packaged and priced for everyone. But like every retail business, time erodes even the mightiest establishments. The winds of change had caught up, with Sears, and the digital age was that wind. Sears found itself at a crossroad, its physical stores facing the challenge of the virtual frontier. The very catalog that birthed it all, once a marvel of convenience, became a relic of a bygone era. If you were a child after World War II, or maybe even before, born in the 60s, the 70s, you remember that Sears catalog, circling things you wanted for Christmas, for your birthday, my parents' copy of it every year looked like it had been attacked by a bunch of graffiti artists. That catalog made Sears this magical place of dreams and happiness. Everybody loved Sears, whether it was the catalog, the candy counter they had, they sold ice cream. I don't know how many bikes I got there in my life. Then you have people like my wife. Her grandmother worked there for years, like I had said, and she just remembers going there to visit grandma on lunch at like three years old till she was probably 12. On September 24th, 2018, Sears CEO warned that the company was running out of time to salvage the business. Sears Holdings filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on October 15th, 2018, just ahead of a $134 million debt payment due date. 
Over the next few years, they closed stores and tried to cling on and tried to salvage the company. In 2017, they announced that they were opening new stores with a limited set of merchandise under the name Sears Home and Life. They started shutting down Sears stores through 2019 into 2020 and 2021 including the final Sears in Maine at the Maine Mall. As of September 16th, 2021, the company's website listed 35 stores. On January 19th, 2022, Sears shut the remaining 15 Sears auto centers in the United States. If you go to the website, it just says, auto centers have closed for business. We appreciate your patronage over the years. As of July, 2023, there are only eight full line Sears stores that remain open. All right, that's today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. Now go out, have a great day, and be nice to each other.